Hello. Hi guys, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, today I will be actually talking about breastfeeding and sharing with you knowledge about breastfeeding for this week. So let's get started. So let's talk about the history about breastfeeding. We know that since the beginning of humankind, women have breastfed. So in the 1920s, women were actually encouraged to raise their infants scientifically, also known as by the book. And there's this book, and I put the website here in blue for you guys. And I've also put it under additional resources under the model of breastfeeding. And it was published by L. Emmett Holt called The Care and Feeding of Children. When you see this book, you guys are going to be absolutely amazed. Let me just go ahead and pull this book up for you. Um, I really thoroughly <clears throat> enjoyed looking at this book. Actually, um, let's see where I click on it. We'll do this together just in case that you guys want to look at it. I found this really kind of unique. Um, history truly fascinates me, I'm not going to lie. So um, let's let it load and see what this looks like. It's handwritten. There's been several copies, um, re-editions re made of this book, um, but I hope that you guys find this truly, truly interesting. Um, even has the um, appendix here to show you, or the, the index to show you what all is on each one of these pages, but I love it. I love um, this book, and I think that it's really, truly unique. See how it's got some handwritten ledger on here. Um, but I absolutely find it so unique, so to speak, to just bring this back and how it's available online, and you guys can really look into what this looks like. So I encourage you to look through this book um, and see history and how it's shaped and where we came from um, is so unique to me. So I hope that you thoroughly enjoy that I'm sharing this with you now. So let's keep going. This book actually recommended breastfeeding times, okay? And it actually said exactly how often you should breastfeed at the exact time of day, um, however many hours apart, even during the night. Another kind of unique thing that I learned from this book is it states water may be given if the infant showed signs of thirst. And I remember um, sitting in a ball game one time when my youngest was um, just a brand new baby and I was breastfeeding and one of the moms said, I remember way back when that we used to give water to our babies when they were just born. And I was like, really? I've never heard that. And so here it is. And I just found that so unique that history kind of um, changes throughout time. So it was published, republished in 1935, emphasizing breastfeeding better, so to speak, over artificial milk. And if the mother was unable to do this, they were to find another woman to do it, whether that be a wet nurse or to try to find breast milk from an agency, friends, or relatives. At the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, there were marked disparities found in infant mortality between breastfed and those who were artificially fed. Um, so that was kind of a unique difference. In 1922, 85 to 90% of children were continued to be breastfed at the one year or 12 month mark. And that was in the United States. In 1938, Women's Magazine actually reflected an attitude trying to say, you know, you think you can nurse your baby, but there's a lot of women who can't do it. And, you know, you might be one of those. And so that kind of put the mindset into women that, you know, you just can't do it. 
you know, it's not being done that often, then you're probably not going to be able to do it either. You're not going to be successful either, so to speak. In 1965, the breastfeeding initiation rate started to decline, you know, it went down to 38%. And at three months of age, went actually down to 12%. So that's a really remarkable difference. And I will show you rates today so you can kind of compare and contrast. 1970s came along, only 24% of women breastfed at least once prior to being discharged from the hospital. And that's a really low number. Um, and they found that pasteurized formulas um, were safe substitutes. And it, it was fine to do that, you know. Then in 1991, the World Health Organization and the United Nations Children's Fund launched what they, what is now known, which we all should know these terms, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, to encourage implementation of the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding and the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. And that was actually updated again in 2018. But just so you know, it launched in um, 1991. And I will show you what that looks like in a couple slides. In 1997, the American Academy of Pediatricians made its first policy actually um, statement aimed to educate all pediatricians to recommend exclusive breastfeeding as what is known as the optimal nutrition for an infant's growth and development, actually from birth to age six months, and then said you could actually extend that to 12 months, and so that was okay. In 2005, they published revisions to this, saying, um, it, or actually expanding on the specific actions to optimize breastfeeding success for women. And this included the following, breastfeeding education during pregnancy. It was always felt to try to encourage moms, you know, that should actually be an option for your child when it's born. As soon as the baby's born, we actually really try to encourage skin to skin contact for you guys who are OB nurses or love OB, which I thoroughly, thoroughly do. And um, skin to skin contact should be one of the first things. As soon as baby's delivered, it goes up to mom, even before we even cut the cord. Um, that should be done first. So um, just encouraging that. And, and I'll be talking about what that looks like with that first and why that is so important later on. Evaluation of breastfeeding and daily in the hospital. So, you know, we have lactation consultants and they should be making rounds on these moms who want to, who want to breastfeed and, and seeing them every day to try to continue to encourage them to breastfeed and close follow-up by the clinician in the first two weeks after they're discharged to try to see how it's going and what we can do to continue that. Here's the 10 steps to, to successful breastfeeding. There's an A, B, and Z in number one, just so you're not confused. So it kind of looks like there's more than 10, but nonetheless, um, one is broken down into A, B, and C. I will tell you that I've been part of this initiative in the hospital um, when I was professional development coordinator in the acute nursery and peds at Catawba Valley Medical Center. I actually got to be um, involved in this step. And it was very, very interesting to me. I actually did the policy for all the breastfeeding and I really, really enjoyed that. So um, that, was a, that was a big deal to me to actually say that I was involved in such an initiative. And of course they ended up getting um, the um, award or so to speak, so. Now the CDC actually has a, what is known as a report card, a breastfeeding report card compared with the Healthy People 2020 objectives. And you guys should all be familiar with Healthy People 2020 because in your clinical case narratives, we always have to mention something about Healthy People 2020 and how that relates to what our um, case study is about. So our clinical case narrative is about, excuse me, Percentage of infants ever breastfed, and it comes right from this website. So I want you guys, I encourage you also to look at this website again. Percentage of infants ever breastfed, 83.2% versus a target known as 81.9. So we're kind of really above target, so to speak. So that's great. Proportion of infants breastfed at the age of 12 months. Actually, CDC found that 35.9% 
versus that target of 34.1%. So that's great. So there again, we're above average on that. Proportion of infants exclusively breastfed through three months of age, 46.9 versus that target of 46.2. So I think that's very great numbers. And that's something to really, really brag about to patients of how well we're above target when we're looking at Healthy People 2020 and what the objectives are. CDC is useful in comparing breastfeeding rates between different states as well as comparing individual states and the nation's progress in breastfeeding rates over time. So if you're interested in that, um, I put that website there for you guys um, for your own review. So we talk about population health, breast is best, so to speak. And, and that's kind of what's dictated in the book. And I just want you guys to know where this information came from. This is the book that I did not require for you guys to buy. Um, it's a pretty lengthy book. And what I've done is I've taken really big, important concepts and I've put it into a 30 slide PowerPoint presentation for you guys to kind of skim over to know about breastfeeding and what may present to your office in primary care or wherever you decide to work. So I just kind of wanted you to know that. So these aren't pre-made PowerPoints. These are, these are PowerPoints that I actually made from reading um, this book. So I, I hope that you guys can kind of see that. Okay. Longer duration of breastfeeding by the mo mother is actually associated with a lower risk of the following. And that's ovarian cancer, a re a reduced risk for type two diabetes, and of course, hypertension. And you know, as well as I do, if it decreases your risk for hypertension, that also impacts um, a heart attack, coronary artery disease, and of course, stroke. So I apologize for some of these typos. I see these as I'm going through. So I will fix those before I put that out for you guys. So not being breastfed as an infant has been associated with higher rates of infectious morbidity, um, childhood leukemia, SIDS, so sudden infant death syndrome, <coughs> necrotizing intercolitis, obesity, diabetes, and they've also found it to um, be associated with the lower IQ in patients. So that's another thing. So what's recommended? <clears throat> it's recommended to exclusively breastfeed. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> For the first six months with a continuation through one to two years of life. Okay, I'm gonna grab some water. Hold on. Okay, my apologies for that. So as a provider, informing families or mothers, so to speak, because we like to involve anybody that we can <clears throat> when we're talking about population health, about the health importance of breastfeeding. It's also a good component to kind of educate your patients and support healthy outcomes for both mom and baby, because that's essentially what we're trying to do. So I love this little picture. It's the breastfed baby. It kind of tells you what um, breastfeeding does for babies and what it supports and um, what it targets, so to speak. So there's stages of lactation. So I find this very unique to know <clears throat> that they're divided up into four different areas. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Mammogenesis is actually the enlargement of the breast during pregnancy from that proliferation of the ducto alveolar structure. Then you have stage one lactogenesis, and that's the onset of the milk secretion. It begins with the early changes in the mammary gland during pregnancy and it continues until full lactation has occurred. So we think of this as like the colostrum. Okay, so to speak. Stage two lactogenesis begins when the secretion of milk becomes copious, and that's within the first 10 days. So you'll actually see that color change in the milk production by the mom. 
Phase three begins with the establishment of mature milk production, and that's usually an average between 10 to 14 days. So um, human milk, of course, you guys know, is highly complex composition of nutrients for infants growth, okay? Consisting of primarily fat, <clears throat> carbohydrates, proteins, minerals, vitamins, and we can't forget nutrients for the baby. And what we have found and through evidence-based practice is that's the only substance that is truly needed and adequate as the sole nutrition for an infant during this time period. So what about the immunological significance of human milk? Um, literature, of course, has found as early as 1892, its protective effect <clears throat> of breast milk against infection. Exclusivity and duration of breastfeeding is also an important consideration to measure whenever we're talking about immunological benefits of breast milk. Of course, the longer a mom breastfeeds an infant, the better their immune system is, so to speak. And there's evidence that's consistently found in the literature about this. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. And it says at least partial breastfeeding after the introduction of solid foods, which is normally about between four and six months um, for an additional 12 months or longer. <clears throat> There's the literature. Evidence-based practice has found decreased risk for the following acute otitis media, the GI infections, lower respiratory tract diseases in breastfed infants in those developed countries. So the protein of breast milk is species specific and non-allergic for human infants, unless there's some specific abnormality of the infant's immune response, meaning, okay, meaning no antibody response has ever been demonstrated to occur with human milk and in infants, meaning nobody is allergic to breast milk, okay? <clears throat> no infant is allergic to breast milk, okay? There's no such thing as an allergy to breast milk, okay? So let's talk about that first hour. Immediately after the placenta has been separated, you know, we talked about skin-to-skin <clears throat> -skin contact, right? Baby comes out, baby goes skin-to-skin -to, -skin to mom. We wait this certain amount of time, so to speak, for that pulsation to stop. And once it stops, we cut the cord. The infant should be immediately placed, there it is, on the mother's chest or abdomen to root for and seek the breast. This is known as the breast crawl, okay? The first hour of birth, <clears throat> the baby's more alert, okay? They're so alert and they're opening their eyes and they're just into the world. And it's such a beautiful thing. If you've never seen it, or you don't have kids of your own, um, it's just such an amazing time and you just can't get over how alert the babies are. The odor of the breast, that maternal heartbeat, the maternal heart itself, um, and the infant vernix all combine to help the infant orient to that breast. Okay, <clears throat> I just think that is so incredible. It's such a beauty. Common breastfeeding positions, just so you guys can know <clears throat> and are um, oriented to, so to speak. You can do a laid back nursing position. That's normally how it is when, when we go skin to skin with the infant and when the baby's doing that breast crawl to get to the breast for that first time. Mama's laid back after the C-section, mama's laid back. <clears throat> There's the cross cradle hold. Y'all can see how this is working. Y'all can read the football hold. Always good with twins to do the football hold, putting a pillow up underneath that arm, so to speak, to help hold um, the arm up. Sideline position, always remember to never um, sleep with the infant in bed at night. Never a good thing because you can roll over and suffocate the infant. And of course, the cradle hold. <clears throat> Sounds like hunger, of course, in the infant is when the infant starts to begin to stir. You know, they start waking up, bringing their hands to their mouth, trying to root, sucking on anything that comes close to them, even if it's their fingers. Increasing activity of the arm and legs, they're getting flexed and hands 
and fist are flexed, you know, they're ready, they're ready to eat, they're ready to eat. And if they're not picked up, they progress in frantic movements, may even begin to whimper. And of course, cry is known as that late sign of hunger in the infant. Diagnosis and breastfeeding problems. So here we go, let's talk about the chief complaint in HPI. What you wanna ask a patient that comes into your office is, hey, what, what, what are your goals for breastfeeding? You know, talk to me about that. How can I help you get there? Or how can I keep supporting you throughout this process? You need to talk to them about their supply and, and their latch process. And, and questions around that would be, how many times a day is the infant receiving another form of feeding, if at all, okay? How much is given in the bottle and when? Is, is it the mother's own milk? Is it infant's formula? Is it a donor milk? If it is donor milk, where are you getting it from? You know, ask all these questions. Um, how much total formula are you using throughout the day, if any? Are you pumping? Are you expressing daily? How much are you expressing? Talk to me about that. How much of mother's own milk is stored, if any? You know, how much are they putting back? <clears throat> for later on. We always get a maternal um, pain history, past medical history, social history. You want to talk about breast changes in pregnancy, their birth history, medications, family history of breastfeeding, or even low milk supply. If um, you know that your mom breastfed you, but she had a low milk supply, you know, you need to know questions like that. Um, so their support system, um, do they have any depression? Any safety or abuse screening, has, has that been completed? Do we know what that looks like as the provider? Ask specifically about any fertility treatments. And that's an important um, component to obtaining the history because some patients do not necessarily consider this to fit in any other categories. So you need to know that as the provider when you're providing care to these patients. Infant pain and discomfort history. There's the past medical history, social history, birth history, medications, family history of tongue tied or speech delays and sleep problems. So that's all about the infant in that scenario. And you as the provider kind of need to know the basis of what that looks like as well, okay? Just remember tongue tied can also cause issues if the mom is breastfeeding, okay? And a lot of physicians are really um, in the hospital so, you know, before when my child was born, he was tongue tied, he was snipped immediately. The tongue was snipped, you know, the frenul the was snipped immediately. Um, nowadays, it's like, we'll wait till you go to the primary care office, and let the pediatrician do that. So there's a lot of um, ifs and, and buts about that on whether they're still doing that or not in the hospital. <clears throat> So what are some maternal problems with breastfeeding? So generally, and I've put this down here and then I've actually broken it up into its own individual slide to kind of talk more about it. So just want you to know, I'm kind of listing it here. I do put some things on here, but for those that are kind of bigger ideas or bigger concepts, I broke those down individual slides. So you'll see that in a second. So related to engorgement, those painful nipples and lactogenesis, that two, type two or milk supply. So it's so important to make sure mom gets adequate rest, okay? Because maternal fatigue is such a big thing and that can really impact mom's milk supply. Encourage them to sleep when baby sleeps. And I always say that a lot, but, but it's hard. And what if they have other children and they can't do that? It's not feasible for them. You know, what does that look like? What questions can you ask related to that section? What about engorgement? <clears throat> and I broke this down in a couple of slides, but I'll go ahead and hit it here. Up to 75% of women experience engorgement in the first few weeks after delivery. Hand expression or hand pumping to remove about one to two ounces relieves that pressure and actually kind of alleviates that engorgement. Some differentials that you need to be thinking about if you have a patient who comes to you would be gyne gynecomastia of pregnancy, mastitis, and hyperlactation, okay? Medications, um, also like acetaminophen or ibuprofen may be given to the mother for some relief and is safe for nursing an infant, so that is okay. <clears throat> Drainage of breast and milk supply prevent backup pressure in ducts, which eventually may depress milk production, so you have to be aware of that. Nipple pain, although many women should not complain 
of pain, about 10 to 96% report pain. Now that's a big range to me. When I looked at this, I was like, gosh, that's a really broad range. But just so you know, it can happen as little or as much as, so you see that. So what's some differentials for nipple pain? Um, there's trauma from uh, suboptimal latch or pump trauma. There's vasospasms, dermatitis, subacute mastitis, nipple blebs, bacterial fungal or viral infections. And I'm gonna break those down in the next couple of slides. <clears throat> so here it is, nipple pain. Here's your differentials. So if somebody comes in, patient comes in, complaining of nipple pain, we need to think, is this trauma? Talk to me about how the baby's latching. <clears throat> That's an an ankyloglossia, unrelieved engorgement, improperly fitting flanges or pumping on that high suction. You know, is that what the issue is? Talk to the, talk to the patient, you can get this out of them, I promise. Normal healing time is usually around eight to 10 days. Why? Because we know about the vascular um, components of the breast. They're so high and um, they heal well, even if they continue to breastfeed, believe it or not. But if the patient does require treatment, um, you keep the wound lubricated with an oil-based emollient cream or ointment. Keep it closed or covered with like a nonstick gauze or hydro gel pad, okay? What about vasospasms? So that's known as like a painful cutaneous vasoconstriction. So um, that presents with hardening of the nipple and color changes. And honestly, it goes from white to blue to red and you will see these nipples just white as paper, like just white. And you know, as well as I do, they shouldn't be white. So um, that's kind of like a like a holding down of, um, of one of the vessels in, in, the, um, in the breast. That's putting the blood supply to the breast and, and that vasospasm, so that little constrictor of that could, could cause that no blood supply to that nipple, if that makes sense. Pain could focus on the nipple or even radiate down, down deep in the breast and it could last up to 30 minutes. Mom usually complains that it's worse after the baby unlatches or she finishes pumping. So as soon as they take the baby off or take the pump off, then that's when they have the pain, okay? So try to think, associate the pain about when it comes on to a possible vasospasm. Treatment includes resolving any underlying persistent trauma such as improper latch and positioning could also help with that. So that would be your treatment, okay? So a nipple bleb, um, and I did put a picture of this on the next slide. It's a white dot or scab, so to speak. Um, there should be one millimeter or less in diameter. It's an inflammatory lesion on the surface of the nipple and can cause pain when the infant starts to latch, okay? It could also obstruct milk flow out to the infant, and you'll see why on the next slide, may present with concurrent acute mastitis. Topical steroid cream may be used to reduce the tenacity and pain of the bleb itself. And in acutely obstructing situations, providers should unroof the bleb by using an 18 gauge sterile needle going parallel to the surface of the bleb, right? And kind of inserting it in to try to relieve some of that pressure, okay? So there's your bleb on the surface of that nipple. So that can kind of put that in perspective for you. So you would just go in parallel to the bleb and just kind of poke that 18, the sterile 18 inch needle inside there to kind of take off the top of that a little bit and try to let it breathe, okay? Subacute mastitis, that's another differential we need to look at. It's an imbalance of the breast flora <clears throat> to bacterial vaginosis, okay? Patient often describes a deep burning breast pain, okay? They have a feeling of fullness, um, painful nipples, and even latching is painful, okay? A white biofilm may be present on the surface of the nipple, 
um, how do you diagnose it? You definitely want to perform a sterile breast milk culture. And that's how we tailor what choice of antibiotic we give the patient. Okay, makes sense. Now there's dermatitis. So, and you'll understand that a lot of these <clears throat> look like um, what, what we all know as yeast so to speak. And so you've got to really be able to differentiate <clears throat> all of these differentials and know what you're dealing with, okay? Dermatitis in the nipples, even the areola area and breast can present as red, burning, and a flaking kind of rash. Usually starts on the areola and migrates to the nipple, okay? A short course of moderate potency steroid rubbed sparingly into that area after each feeding will clear a persistent case in a few days. So of course you would wanna wipe that off before baby goes back to latch again, but in between feedings, you could put on the steroid cream. Bacterial infection, Staph aureus is the most common cause of any soft tissue infection of that nipple areolar complex. And that's what the NAC is, the nipple areolar complex or breast skin and lactation, okay? Oral antibiotics are more effective than topical antibiotics in relieving symptoms and preventing mastitis, okay? Because we sure don't want this to turn into mastitis. So it's very important um, to give the oral antibiotic um, for Staph aureus in this case. Now, um, fungal infections. So we have to talk about fungal infections and that's Candida. Intertigo is the most common superficial fungal infection of the skin of that lactating breast, presented as an itchy or pruritic, beefy red rash. And of course, what is the big tail sign of um, a yeast infection is your satellite lesions. So you have to understand what those look like. If you need to go back and take a look at some of these pictures, please do. Um, I think that's very, very important to see what that looks like. <clears throat> okay, treat this. How do we treat it? So the satellite lesions can also be located in the inframary folds, and that's just the fold between the lower breast tissue and the skin. And that's usually where we find a lot of yeast infections in, in elderly, elderly patients as well. It's treated with topical antifungals, oral fluconazole, and um, gentian violet, okay? Viral, so we talk about viral infections is herpes simplex infection of that um, nipple areolar complex. It presents as a cluster of tender vesicles and can pass between mother and infant. And there's dangers to the neonate, believe it or not. And I know you guys may already know this, especially those infants within an immature immune system. And that's those babies under three months of age, okay? So here's an important concept. Please understand, you need to culture this to diagnose it. You can do what's called a tzank smear. I don't know if I'm spelling that right or saying that right. I'm terrible at pronouncing stuff. I know that you guys probably already know that. A ser serology or a PCR essay. All of those to try to see if it is herpes simplex, okay, virus. Mothers should be treated with a five to seven day treatment regimen of acyclovir, okay, acyclovir. And it's this drug is safe for mom while she is breastfeeding. So it's okay, it's an okay drug. Infants should only nurse from the unaffected breast, right? Because you sure don't need the infant to be latching to a breast with an active herpes lesion, okay? Do not do that. Make sure they understand that. Mother can express milk if she needs to and discard that, okay? <clears throat> Until those lesions um, actually scab over, would it be safe to put the baby back to the breast, okay? Breast conditions in the breastfeeding mother. Providers caring for breastfeeding mothers should master the management of common lactation related conditions. And those are as followed. There's plugging, and we're going to break these down, I promise, mastitis, galactoseals, milk fistulas, dermatitis or dermatosis, pain, and hyperlactation. 
So let's talk about engorgement. Okay, this is known as an obstructive and inflammatory condition, or this one's obstructive, of course, but these are just all things that you need to be aware of. So this is an obstruction. Peaks on postpartum, usually day number five. Patients should not pump to empty their breast, okay, right? Because it makes them make more milk, thus making engorgement worse. Do not have them do that. They should, once again, I said this in a previous slide, hand express or hand pump to remove only one to two ounces. Just kind of relieve a slight bit of that milk out of there. Relieves the pressure on mom. She feels a little bit better. Um, don't have them use nipple shields. If they're a nipple shield user, nipple shell, do not let them use it. Avoid those, okay? A firm supportive bra should be worn to reduce any sort of edema in the area, that nipple areolar complex area of the breast to edema. So what about hyperlactation? So hypergalactia is the production of milk, okay? in excess hyper more lactation so more milk than what the the infant often needs to survive okay um it this will contribute to engorgement plugging any other obstructive inflammatory breast condition of the mom so just try to beware sometimes this can happen mom can overproduce so we're going to talk about why it can be atrogenic, caused by early and excessive pumping. You know, mom's like, you know, I'm going back to work. I need to pump. I'm going to have to put some, some milk up, blah, 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 you know. And so she's pumping, she's pumping. She's getting up every two to three hours. If the baby's not nursing, she's pumping, she's pumping. Um, or purposeful consumption of galactogox. And that just means that um, it's synthetic or plant molecules used to induce or maintain or in, even increase milk production of the breast. And I'll be the first one to say that I did this. Um, I felt like I didn't have a lot of milk supply. Um, and so I bought brewer's yeast and made those lactation balls, you know, to try to help maybe um, help me to produce more milk. So I was one of these people, but I did not have hyperlactation. I needed it for the mere fact that I didn't have a great milk supply. So you can see the difference. So you need to be asking these questions if these things are happening and you'll kind of see a pattern and really be able to diagnose these patients so you can help them with a treatment plan. If these are ruled out or treated, then idiopathic hyperlactation is more likely than the I iatrogenic. Um, may present with breasts that are continuously engorged or painful. They have frequent plugging and mastitis and even those little nipple blebs that we've talked about. Another thing that can kind of key you in is the infants coughing, like they're choked, um, that they release from breastfeeding because they have so much milk that's trying to come in that they're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, I can't do all this milk at one time. So they're releasing on their own. How do we treat it? Eliminate excessive pumping and those foods that help your milk supply. Okay, that's a pretty simple thing. Then you have the patient come back. Is it better? Is it worse? Or come back and see me if it's not getting any better. So then we think, okay, plan B, right? If it's idiopathic, then do block feeding under close supervision of the provider um, is the treatment of choice for that. So have them only do feedings, you know, at certain specific frames, boom. Boom. If there's no improvement, the, the mother can actually use an her herbal supplement known as sage. Okay, we know what sage is, or um, pharmaceutically, pseudoephedrine can also kind of help with that um, to try to decrease that milk supply. After six weeks postpartum, another choice we can think about is estrogen um, containing oral contraception may be considered. So that's another thing that you got to think about um, how far out the mom is from delivering the infant. Let's talk about plugging. A breast plug represents a focal area of obstructed milk in a specific area or segment of the breast that follows a ductal distribution. So we know how the ducts are in the breast. You guys should know anatomy and physiology of the breast, okay? So the ductal distribution, so it actually follows the duct. And that's how we know when there's plugging of the duct itself. 
last usually should last less than 24 hours but it can be quite painful for the mom right because they can't get that to come out and it's and it's blocked okay so this is another obstruction often experiences when infant sleeps longer than usual or moms return to work or school um, and they're separated from the infant for a bigger long period of time because we're used to breastfeeding you know a certain amount of time a day or certain many times a day and then you know boom it stops and the the duct is like hello uh, you're not stimulating me down here and it just wants to clot off so it's like okay fine I'll just shut you out you know done so um other factors, um, pump usage, nipple shield usage, milk that's rich in fatty acid, it's thicker, okay? That's thicker, so it's more easier to plug off. So um, think about that, look at the consistency of the breast milk, and that may clue you in to maybe that being an issue for the plugging, you know? How do we treat it? Apply moist heat to the area of the concern. So you should be able to know, you should that should feel hardened in that area it'll follow the duct pattern and so put heat to so that area avoid excessive massage really and truly massaging deeply like that will stimulate milk production so what it's saying is like a gentle lymphatic massage like barely trying to really easily do that um, to try to let that release is different from the big you know trying to stimulate that breast to make more milk breastfeed and minimize unnecessary pumping so important but however, if you have that patient who has a plugger mass that continues for several days and doesn't resolve with any of these conservative measures, we've done everything we can, it's just not working, she comes back to see you, I have no relief, I've done everything you've told me to, what can I do now? You need to refer to a medical provider, another provider, to obtain breast images, to rule out a galactosil or a mass. Okay, and we're going to break down what that looks like, I promise. Galactosil, true milk retention cyst, okay, galactosil, true milk retention cyst, okay, it's a fluid field cyst, so it's pretty prevalent to know that it's like one area, so it's not like kind of out and spread, it's really a cyst, okay, so it's all contained in this one little, little area, so to speak. That develops from unrelieved plugging during lactation or after a mother stops breastfeeding, okay? How do we confirm it? What diagnostic test do we need? We need an ultrasound or and or a mammography, um, a mammogram. So we may do one or both, but how do we treat it? If it's small, nothing's really required. It actually says that over the course of continuing to breastfeed, it gets smaller and smaller and goes away, right? Kind of kind of dissolves on its own, so to speak. If it's large, patient symptomatic, these actually can be aspirated. If it's aspirated once, the chance that that fills back up is pretty high, okay? And so it may require a repeat aspiration, okay? And um, may convert from what's known as an uninfected to an actually now infected, galactosil and may require you to put in a drain and um, a drain placement for about three to five days um, rather than repeating the aspiration. So let's talk about mastitis. Okay, mastitis, inflammation of the breast tissue that sometimes involves infection. I've seen one of these really bad postpartum mom came in um, ended up suffering from mastitis. Um, it was pretty hard to treat. Had to see her back pretty routinely. She actually had to have it um, incised to drain and unfortunately caused her to stop breastfeeding. So this was a really big case that I saw in my women's health rotation. So let's talk about mastitis, inflammation of the breast tissue that sometimes involves an infection, but what's the risk? Gravita one, right? Uh, Primate, those who breast pump or use nipple shields, who use breast pumps or nipple shields, those with a history of mastitis in the past 
And of course, we can't forget nipple trauma itself can be a risk factor. What's the patient look like? They should have focal breast pain associated with erythema and warmth. So it's going to be reddened and it's going to be warm to touch. And I will show you a picture on the next slide. They may or may not feel systemically ill, like they may not be running a fever, you know, or that kind of thing. But if they do have those symptoms, this is what it's going to look like. They'll have malaise, myalgias, headache, fatigue, fever, and of course, we can't forget tachycardia. Okay, how do we treat it? In early stages of an obstruction, mastitis may represent pure inflammatory phenomenon without an infection. Okay, that's early, early, early stages. But if it's relieved in 24 hours, they may not need antibiotics, okay? If we think we can handle it conservatively and it goes away in 24 hours, good, we're golden. However, if the obstruction and the inflammation process progresses, antibiotic therapy is indicated to treat the bacterial overgrowth and relieve the obstruction by those anti-inflammatory effects, okay? So, you know, the tissue swells, 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 will cause an obstruction. But if we take care of that swelling and we bring it down, maybe the obstruction will also decrease, okay, or go away. Breast milk culture, always remember getting breast milk cultures can be your friend because that's a very big case with this one. If you have somebody who continues to get recurrent mastitis, comes back to you, treated them, comes back to you, then you may want to get a culture and say, okay, we've just been using the wrong antibiotic, you know, and that's okay. That's okay. But we're going to fix it now, right? So don't hesitate to get a culture of that milk to see what's growing in there and, and, and see what will actually kill um, that organism that's growing. <clears throat> Continued breastfeeding on the um, affected breasts should be encouraged to assist in relieving infection, obstruction and even inflammation, and that's okay to do. Other management includes anti-inflammatory medications, analgesics, heat, even ice packs, believe it or not, doing that lymphatic massage, and what's known as therapeutic ultrasound. Now, let me tell you about therapeutic ultrasound, okay? It's using sound waves to penetrate deep into the glands, the lactation glands, to warm up the blockage itself. So, you know, I think that's really kind of unique. So we put ice packs on there, but really and truly these ultrasound waves get deeper and try to help that blockage. So it actually dissolves, helps to um, dissolve that hardened area and allow for the milk to start flow. So I think that's super cool that there's all these unique things out there that can be done for mastitis. Now, remember untreated mastitis. So if we sit on this and the provider sits on it and they don't have the patient back and they don't do continue follow-ups with patients to assure that things are getting better, then that can lead to an abscess formation. Um, and of course, excessive massage in the setting of mastitis may result in lactational phlegmon, okay, a phlegmon. Also result in reduced milk production um, and an increase in sodium content of breast milk. So if there's not a lot of volume, then the sodium content's higher, causing the infant to be like, ooh, I just don't like the taste of this. Yuck, right? No, no thank you. So there's a picture of mastitis. I hope this picture does a little justice on here. So you can kind of see that it's red. If we were to touch that area, be warm to touch, but you see she could still breastfeed there, right? So, um, and that's okay for her to do. So what's the antibiotic regimen for acute infectious lactational mastitis? So this book actually, this first line is diclo, dicloxacillin. There you go, dicloxacillin or flu, flucloxacillin, 500 milligrams four times a day for about 10 to 14 days. So you pick one or the other. Now, if we think we've got MRSA, of course, we need to cover that with clindamycin 300 BID for 10 to 14 days, or we can pick trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole DS 160-800 regimen um, 
BID for 10 to 14 days. So one or the other, but now if there's a sulfa allergy, you can't pick, um, of course, um, the Bactrim, right? You can't pick that one. Avoid if breastfeeding infant is full term and less than eight days of age or is jaundiced, ill-stressed, premature, or have, has that G6PD deficiency. Alternative, alternative therapy, of course, is erythromycin, 250 to 500 milligrams, four times a day for 10 to 14 days. So there's that in case you just kind of want to know that for your knowledge, which I think is, is good to know. So what's a phlegmon? A mass with an indistinct fluid collection. So this is kind of different. So I'll look at this as the galactosil, the fluid-filled cyst versus a phlegmon. So you can see that this is kind of indistinct fluid collection, right? Um, surrounding hyperemic parenchyma and tissue edema. So it looks rather different from the galactosil. In, in the surrounding areas, so to speak, often associated with obstructive, infectious, or inflammatory history, such as plugging or even mastitis. So if the patient says, you know, I had mastitis last week, then you may say, think, mm, you know, is this a phlegmon? You know, is this what we're dealing with? Potentially. Maybe managed, therefore, with an extended round of antimicrobial therapy of four weeks at this point. So we did 10 to 14 days, but now guess what? We've got a phlegmon, we need a good four week period. There's that therapeutic ultrasound. If there's some inflammation in that tissue, uh, it also promotes coalescence into a more drainable collection. So it tries to pull, suck that fluid in and try to see if it could drain a little bit better. So that's always a good thing too. Breast biopsy may be recommended actually to confirm the diagnosis and breastfeeding can be continued. Okay, so just be leery of that. Once we have a benign pathology report back, the patient should come in on a regular interval, what they suggest is every three months with imaging to rule out an occult mass as a lead point for the initial obstruction. So um, just kind of be leery of that on what, um, why they have to be followed up and looked at more closely. So we kind of all know about an abscess. We, we know what these look like. There's a picture here of an abscess. Ultrasound can actually help diagnose abscess and actually help you with your differentiation between a phlegmon. It's not required, so to speak, for diagnosis because usually the clinical signs and symptoms are really characteristic. So you really can kind of know what that looks like. But just in case it's not so obvious, like in this picture, then you may want to consider doing um, um, an ultrasound. On examination, the patient will present with a focal fluctuant, edematous and erythematous fluid collection. Most often it's superficial, like the one in this picture, and will just kind of open up and drain spontaneously, okay? Avoid breast pump use and continue breastfeeding from the affected breast, not discarding milk, okay? Targeted antibiotic therapy based on cultural results is warranted. Okay. So no breast pump and no breastfeeding. Okay. If it's less than five centimeters, it may be amen amenable to aspiration with an 18 gauge needle. Okay. If it's greater than five centimeters, it's going to most likely require a small drain placed by the surgeon or radiologist, often inserted under ultrasound guidance, okay? Another option is a small stab incision using a, a scalpel, which produces the same defect as a percutaneous drain and enables the surgeon to break up those loculations um, within the abscess cavity. And of course, we need to put drains in there have them to gravity and get those out in about three to five days as well, okay? I 
Okay, so of course, just so you know, I reread this for two seconds because I'm like, I don't like how this is stated in the PowerPoint. So I wanted to go back. So avoid breast pump use, but just like mastitis, believe it or not, because I'm like, are you sure that I read this completely right? Continue, do continue breastfeeding from the affected breasts. So don't discard the milk. So, but do avoid breast pump use. Why? Um, because the baby's going to latch better. And of course, equipment's going to be worse on the patient. And so that's the rationale. So I apologize for that. I just thought maybe I had typed it wrong. And I was like, oh my gosh, am I sure I'm saying the right thing? So my apologies there. But I just want you guys to be aware. It's kind of like mastitis. So they can indeed, because I'm looking at this picture and I'm like, would I want the infant to breastfeed next to what we think is an abscess? Wasn't sure about um, how felt about that and how I worded it, but it does say to continue breastfeeding from the affected breast to not discard the milk. So my apologies there. So making sure I read what I wrote right. Breast imaging. So let's talk about breast imaging because I know we've talked about doing some scans. So um, this is known as an extension of that physical exam that we do on patients. Acute breastfeeding issues should resolve with proper intervention. However, if we have that persistent issue, like we've talked about, such as an unrelieving plug, it should be referred for breast imaging, beginning with a breast ultrasound, which may or may not require a mammogram, okay? Mammograms and MRIs do not require interruption of breastfeeding and are safe for both mom and infant, okay? We recommend that mothers should express milk, and this makes complete sense, and drain the breast fully before they have any images done on their breast to make sure there's no density in their density areas, areas or things that could um, obs obscure the view of what we're trying to see in the tissue itself, okay? So we don't want pictures of the milk and that try to not show us pictures that we really need to see. So have them fully drain their breast prior to the um, imaging. Routine breast cancer screening in lactation is also safe, right? And should be considered in patients, especially those at high risk with family history, a known gene mutation like your BRCA genes or otherwise meets the screening guidelines just because of their age, right? So maternal nutrition and supplements, okay? Recommendations for maternal supplementation during lactation are unnecessary unless the mother's diet is deficient, okay? Unless we found that their diet is um, deficient in some, some area. Make sure they continue their prenatal vitamins. Um, that's usually adequate. Weight loss during lactation is the greatest between um, three and six months postpartum. Dietary advice for women who choose to diet while lactating should include the following. A diet of balanced um, foods rich in calcium, zinc, mag, vitamin B6, folate. All of these things are good for the immune system, right? The minimum energy intake um, should be 1,800 kilocalories. Calcium and multivitamins, it says you may have to have, give them uh, mineral supplements to replace anything that's uh, marginal or depleted, so to speak. Some infants do not tolerate certain, certain foods in the mother's diet. And I think this is kind of important to put here. So you have to think about diets. Those are as followed. Um, you've got garlic, onions, cabbage, turnips, and of course, apricots, prunes, or beans may cause 24-hour colic in some infants. So just little highlights. It's always good for moms to keep food diaries to see what may have upset baby or whatever. You know what I mean? To try to see if they can eliminate foods that may be causing issues with the baby. Heavy diet of melon, peaches, and other fresh fruit have been known to cause colic and even diarrhea as well. The red pepper, which has capsaicin in it, causes dermatitis in, in breastfed infants an hour after they've eaten, okay? And lasts about 12 to 48 hours. So that's another important one to say, mm, you might wanna think about what this looks like for the baby, okay? 
Let's talk about weaning, the transition of the infant from dependence of mother's milk reliance on um, to other sources of nourishment for their health growth, nutrition, and also development. Current re recommendations are for six months of exclusive breastfeeding, initiating those foods between the ages of four and seven months <clears throat> with continued breastfeeding through 12 months, and they say even beyond that. It can take many forms depending on when it's begun, how it's begun, and who initiates it. Is it mom that initiates it? Is it baby? Um, usual progression includes four different kind of phases, um, accustoming the infant to small amounts of foods other than the breast milk before they're needed for nutrition. Adding foods when breast milk can no longer meet your child's nutritionist needs, okay? Replacing breast milk with other foods, and of course, stopping breastfeeding completely. This can be emotional for um, mom and even baby. So <clears throat> be sure you understand that and what they're going through. When breastfeeding is not an option, you've got HIV-1, HIV-2, HTLV, which is the human T-cell leukemia virus type one and virus type two are the only infectious diseases that are truly considered contraindications to breastfed in developed countries. So just know that severe fulminant infections in the mother can be contraindicated as well, such as EBD, um, the Lassa fever, rabies, and so forth. Now I leave you with this breast milk storage guidelines. Um, this is found online talking about the collections and storage of human milk and um, human milk banking. Countertop is okay for like three to four hours. Talks about um, what research shows. Insulated, a cooler bag, um, 24 hours. Refrigerator, less than five days. Freezer, depends on the type of freezer. So then it breaks it down. Um, so separate with separate doors or is it a freezer test or what's known as a deep freeze? So you can see that I think this is always important to kind of talk about and what that looks like, because they truly, if you think about it, they truly don't need to excessively pump, right? Because um, it, it, depending on what kind of freezer that they have, it's only good for three to six months. So are you going back to work? Is that why you're pumping? Are you going to do half days and somebody else is going to feed the baby while you're working half days or whatever the case may be? So it's, it's, kind of is a big eye opener to tell moms, you know, do you have to be pumping so excessively or what does that look like? So that's it as far as um, I'm looking around because I think there's one more thing that I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about. You will notice that chapter 17 is also in your book, in this book, that's everything falls on the floor. In your book, I've listed chapter 17 as far as um, breast pain is considered, you've already had chapter 17. So you had that week, go back to my course guide, guys. Week seven, you had that, that material. So just so you guys know, that's, that's something we've already covered, but if you kind of want to highlight that a little bit to talk about nostalgia and what that looks like in regards to your book versus this other book, I encourage you to do so. That is okay by me when it's talking about breast pain and some differentials surrounding that area. That's okay. Um, any questions that you have regarding this material on the quiz will be very self-explanatory. I can promise you that it will come directly from the quiz um, I'm from the PowerPoint itself. So don't stress out about looking at other things or whatever. I'll make them pretty discreet where you kind of know exactly what that looks like, okay? Um, I think we've done an excellent job making sure that you guys have gotten what you need as far as, um, yeah, I think it's perfect. I'm looking at, at the need to know and I think we've covered it all so I'm pretty excited we're done with breastfeeding I hope you've enjoyed this lecture I hope it's been very beneficial to you guys um, I hope that you didn't mind that I didn't make you buy this book and that I've kind of condensed it myself I know when I was in the program the slides were 96 slides and I've tried to condense it down to a 30 taking this whole book and um, thinking about the needs to know 
and condensing that for you guys. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. I look forward to seeing you guys in a couple weeks. Thanks.